Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete episode 20 of our RimWorld series in the Cold Bog with the Cult of Jinx. Last time we left off, after recruiting the wild woman Freya to our village of Liviana, we also constructed ourselves a proper temple in the swamp, and we have planted yet another Gauranlin tree, this time to produce some claw dryads to help with the colony's defense. In between episodes, I have also installed the Interaction Bubbles mod due to popular demand, so shortly after our bug hive once again grows, we can begin the day with a few more insights into what our colonists are actually talking about. An eclipse unfortunately keeps things dark for now, but at least inside of our temple slash greenhouse we can still grow something, namely a few small bonsai trees. Just like potted plants, these only need a light level of 30%, which can be achieved with solar pinholes, torches or campfires, and they provide a moderate beauty increase of 15 points per plant. Additionally, they last almost an entire in-game month, much longer than the day lilies we are growing in the pots next to our small altar over here. To make up for that, the flowers have a higher beauty rating, but I think for a colony with the tree connection meme, a few miniature trees fit really well. A short time later then, we are also joined by our second berry maker dryad, which will now receive the name Moondragon, as always named after a generous patron supporter. With that, we now once again have two berry makers in Liviana, and kibble production should be secured for the foreseeable future. To keep our colonists fed, we are now also hunting another mega sloth, as well as a few ibex. The eclipse has now also ended, so our shots should be a bit more accurate, and with that we are already nearing the end of this first day. Before we send everyone off to bed, however, Liviana is visited by a shaman merchant who comes in with quite the caravan, so perhaps we can acquire a few useful items from them. In the meantime, our anima tree is ready for another linking ritual, and as you can see, we now have four candidates to choose from, with Chutney and Freya both capable of learning Psycasts as well. For today, all four of them can keep meditating though, while we begin securing our base a bit more, the wall here will hopefully ensure that our barricade is not so easily flanked. Of course, the trade caravan makes it into our village without issues, and we are actually doing some business here. Since we will never research medicine with this colony, we might as well sell our Nutriamine, and we can also get rid of the Joy Wire, for all we know the next ruin probably has three of them. With the silver we earn from that, we will now buy ourselves a Psychic Shock Lance, a great tool if we want to capture a specific attacker, or if we just need to incapacitate a particularly nasty foe. Still, this is definitely something you don't necessarily need to have, but in the right situation I think we might be glad we bought it. With that, we can now skip ahead to the next morning, which begins with Maniac doing some mining, because we likely need quite a few more traps around the place, and the only traps that really do good damage are made from steel. In the meantime, our wall project continues to grow, and we also receive another quest, it is yet another treasure hunt. Although we don't learn much about it, difficulty seems to be manageable and the location is also not too far away. However, we might have slightly different priorities first before we send out a caravan to go scavenging. With our anima tree ready to go, we will now link up Specs for one last time to give her the 6th and final Psycaster rank. This is where things get really powerful, but since we are keeping things Neolithic, this is also very likely a necessity to deal with the increasingly overwhelming tech levels of our enemies. Chutney and Freya get to participate to perhaps regrow a few patches of anima grass, while Maniac is not going to be involved and can instead keep mining. Meanwhile, Coco and Tux spend their time hunting a wolf, and Freya also finally gets the mental break we have all probably anticipated already. Luckily though, the anima tree linking ceremony is not interrupted. In fact, it ends successfully, with three patches of grass being immediately restored, and with Specs learning the Neuroquake Psycast. Now, Neuroquake is very much a double-edged sword. On one hand, it is probably the most powerful Psycast in the game, able to turn a large group of enemies within a 60 tal radius insane and into a berserk state. On the other hand, it is absolutely not suited for regular use in every raid, because casting it will put Specs into a 5-day coma afterwards. 
In that sense, it is more a last resort to prevent disaster and not something we want to use mindlessly. So, all in all, I am not complaining, but I think I would have preferred something like Berserk Pulse over it. Now, with the caravan leaving again, the rest of the day remains mostly uneventful. Our small temple receives a few more Neil Sheets to house everyone and to further increase the impressiveness rating, but other than that, we don't have much else to report. That is, until we are visited by another trade caravan in the evening, this time a combat supplier. And believe it or not, just a few seconds later yet another trader arrives, and from the very same faction as well, so it looks like we'll have two more chances here to grab something useful. To perhaps kind of make up for our good luck, Randy then strikes our two muffalos Shadow Mage and Redea with the flu, but one or two doses of herbal medicine should keep them both safe. In the meantime, we have a much bigger problem developing near our insect hives, as one of the traders has chosen this path to advance into our village and is now completely eradicating all insects as well as their hives. So I guess it was fun while it lasted, but it looks like our infinite supply of insect meat has now come to an end. I was actually also planning to use those insects to help with the completion of this quest right here, but I guess two trade caravans are a good choice as well, as we are now accepting the quest to hack another space drone for the final piece of info about the Horn of Edmo. In doing so, we also invite pirates to attack us every 8 hours, so let's hope that those caravans stick around for a while to help with that. Now, as soon as we know where the drone is landing, we are sending Maniac over there immediately. From now on, we want to have a colonist working on this at all times, because the quicker we are done hacking, the fewer raids we are going to see. To ensure that we can keep hacking even during the attacks, we are now also constructing some granite walls around the drone and put up some traps in front of it as well. This will of course not protect the drone forever and the path through the water will remain open, but it will slow down our attackers a bit and funnel them to that right side, which hopefully makes things a bit easier for us. Conveniently enough, the drone also landed right in front of our defenses. Had it dropped somewhere near the edge of the map, we could have considered just letting the pirates destroy it, but I think I like our chances in this location, especially with some reinforcements nearby. As you can see though, this is a bit of a sleepless night for most of our colonists, but we only have a few hours to get everything up and running. With Redini busy constructing, Jack and I now takes a look at the first trader's inventory, and yes, we can sell a lot of stuff here, especially all of that pigskin and some lower quality tribal wear. We are not buying anything from them though, and just take the silver over to the other caravan, but unfortunately they don't have anything of interest either. The Plasteel Dane Axe or the Plasma Sword would have been interesting, but our current finances sadly do not allow us to make a purchase right now. And so we can instead watch as the timer continues to tick down and the drone is becoming increasingly fortified. With only two hours left to go then, we have almost everything in place and both caravans are also still there, so it is time to slowly get ready for the first attack. Since we need Maniac shooting his bow for this one, we are now putting Thoraya on hacking duty, while her husband and the rest of the village line up behind our defenses. Shortly after then, the raiders arrive, 13 of them equipped with a good mixture of guns and melee weapons. We also have a few people with shield belts among them, as well as one person with marine armor, good candidates to send into a berserk state, if we are able to. And indeed, using the Psychic Insanity Lands on Redini, we can now turn the marine armor wearer against their compatriots. This should definitely slow the group down a bit and cause one or two casualties. With a vertical pulse from Specs, we can then keep our enemies from shooting at us for a little while longer, and of course also protect the drone and Thoraya. Eventually then, our already somewhat decimated attackers reach the drone, but at this point the caravan has made it over to help as well, and at this point I think we should have the upper hand. One enemy then does breach our defenses and gets a few hits in on Turk, but they also die shortly after and that causes the rest of the attackers to flee. 
At the Space Drone, meanwhile, we are at roughly 400 out of 750 points, so let's see if we can complete the hack before the next wave arrives. For the next 8 or so hours, our main concern is now to keep everyone happy and to rebuild those traps, but since we have stockpiled a good amount of steel and did not suffer any injuries to our builders, this should be very doable. By the way, the original plan would have been to let the insect hive repopulate a few more times and to then lure a large wave of bugs into the pirates, but I suppose this method here works just as well. Unfortunately then, but also somewhat expected, the trade caravans are leaving while the repairs are still underway, and it also looks like we won't be able to complete the hack before the next wave arrives, so let us once again set up positions. This time around, we have constructed a few more traps to make up for the lack of backup. Let's hope that that's enough, as the second attack now rolls in. Once again, 13 people with a similar mix of ranged and melee weapons, and also once again with some shield wearers and a guy in marine armor. First order of business as they get close is then another vertical pulse to slow down their approach, and with Redini we now want to use the second charge of the Insanity Lance to drive one of their shielded melee units berserk. As you can see, this causes a bit of a commotion, and so our colonists seem to be protected, at least for the time being. A second vertical pulse followed up by another berserk psychast then stalls our attackers even further, all while Thoraya is inching closer and closer to the completion of the hack. However, it looks like it won't be necessary to complete that in order to drive off the raiders, who seem to have suffered enough losses to call for the retreat now. No further injuries on our part, I would say that was nicely done, and so we can now watch as everyone except for Thoraya now tops up their food, sleep and recreation bars, while Thoraya herself completes the hack, and with that acquires the last bit of info about the Horn of Edmo. Shortly after then, the space drone explodes and the quest is completed, and our hunt for the Horn of Edmo is almost over. With this last bit of info, we now have a location for the mysterious relic. However, if we take longer than three days to get there, we will be met with some automated defenses. Thankfully though, the location is not too far away from Liviana, so let us launch a caravan immediately to get there before things get dangerous. Since Bex needs to stay home to prune her Garanlin tree, we will send out Maniac and Chutney together with Muffalo Tina, just in case we find something worthwhile that needs to be carried back home. In terms of supplies, we are being generous here with a few extra rations of pemmican, and after a short time packing everything together, we can watch our two cultists leave the map in the late evening. Just a few hours later, we are then informed that fall has arrived, and so the cold bog is about to get, well, colder, and considerably so. Still, feelings inside of Liviana are potentially getting hot and heavy, as Armando, who is currently deconstructing our temporary defenses with his partner Redini, has just proposed a marriage. Sadly though, Redini has rejected the idea, but that doesn't stop Armando from simply trying again a few moments later, and this time with success. Who knew that all it takes is just a bit of persistence? In any case, we will likely marry the two of them very, very soon. In the meantime, Jekna has just finished another sculpture, this one showing specks under a hickory tree surrounded by a black aura, and with thousands of surgeons looking at her, as well as with an octopus lurking in the background. Certainly an interesting choice of motive, but who are we to judge? Let's put it inside of our small common room while the crafting of Cambia moves into the temple now. Other than that though, the day remains fairly uneventful. Our bears are probably happy about the influx of fresh meat after the two raids, we are selecting a handful of weapons to keep around, just in case, and Redini tries to convert Freya once more, but she still doesn't quite get through to her just yet. On the next morning then, our two adventurers arrive at the relic complex, and I think it is quite obvious where we need to go here. And there it is, the Horn of Edmo sitting right there in the middle, ready to be taken. A few seconds later, Maniac holds it in his hands and for some reason everyone immediately knows about it and receives a healthy mood bonus of 15 points. And since this is all there is to grab on the map, we can immediately head back home, where we will then put the Horn on proud display. 
Now, full disclosure, normally there would be a handful of sleeping mechanoids on the map guarding the relic, but with the deactivation of mechanoids for this series, they are of course not present. All in all, this does not really change much in my opinion, as again they are sleeping if you arrive in time, allowing you to get in and grab the relic undetected. Doing that will then activate them, but getting out would not have been too difficult with someone like Spex and her skip sidecast, so it's not like we have circumvented an overly difficult encounter here. Still, I wanted to let you know, as this deviates a tiny bit from what these relic complexes are usually like. Back in Liviana, meanwhile, the Royal Tribute Collector is passing by, but as always we have nothing to give to them, and can instead focus on using that left side of the river to expand the quarters of Freya a bit. The rest of the colony will likely soon follow and get their respective rooms upgraded as well, but as you know, space is a bit more limited on that right side, so this is an easy point to start. With winter getting closer, we should probably also start thinking about our food supply soon, now that the insects are no more and wild animals will also become increasingly rare over the next weeks, and for that reason a small hunting party ventures out in the night to hunt some elk, but perhaps we will need to increase our number of berry maker dryads as well, just to keep up with the demand. On the next morning then, we can gaze upon yet another sculpture from Jekna, this one aptly titled Blood, and showing an animal in abstract shape with a dancer behind it. Once again, let's move it into our common room and put her previous work in Spex's quarters, who is the main focus of that one after all. Inside of our temple, meanwhile, we are getting the place ready for the next level, and that means things are going to get bigger and better. I'll show you what exactly that means in just a moment, for now we have received another quest, although one that is easy to reject. I don't think that our small cult of Jinx is in any position to fight off well over a hundred tribal attackers, especially not two groups of them, and especially not for rewards that we don't really have any use for at the moment. So instead let's keep building, and we can also sadly disassemble the remains of that ancient danger, the marble will shortly be put to good use elsewhere though. In the evening then, our small caravan returns and with that the Horn of Edmo is finally where it should be, now it's only a matter of finding a suitable place to display it. For the time being though, while we briefly take note of a nearby steel mining worksite, we jump ahead to the following morning, which sees our colony go on yet another hunting trip. Freya's bedroom, meanwhile, has been properly upgraded now with a few more bonsai trees. She is likely going to become a tree specialist as soon as she changes her beliefs over to the Cult of Jinx, so I consider this very fitting. Now, the arrival of the Horn of Edmo is of course cause for a celebration, and so Thoraya is now putting up a small campfire inside of our temple. In doing so, we have just earned ourselves a 20% quality bonus to the Big Bang Drum Festival that is about to take place, and indeed we are about as well prepared for this as we could be, except for the fact that one of the ritual rewards cannot be received, as we already have an active ancient complex on the map, and apparently you can't have two. Still, let's aim for the mood bonus and hopefully for some ideology development points as well, as our cultists drum away and celebrate the recovery of the Horn of Edmo. And there we go, the Big Bang was fun, resulting in a plus 8 mood bonus and one ideology development point, only 4 more to go until we can reform the Cult of Jinx for the second time. And the next ritual might be closer than you think, but before we begin let us now construct a marble reliquary, our very first object consuming some gold, but thankfully we have a bit of that. Arguably even more problematic, however, is its construction time, because even after all the materials have been delivered, and with two decorative muffalo fur drapes now also in the works, we are looking at roughly 3700 construction points. In other words, this is going to take forever. And yes, I know we could have made this out of steel for a much, much faster construction process, but we want to give the Horn of Edmo the proper respect, so marble it is, which takes roughly six times as long to work with. And so we are once again working in shifts here to keep the construction going at all times, and to be honest, since the next days were thankfully fairly uneventful, we can skip through this a bit more quickly. 
On the following morning, another bear sees the light of day, and Vladimir's latest daughter will now go by the name of Jasa, of course once again chosen from the list of patrons in the naming rights tier and above. Most of the day is then spent hunting before all of those animals wander off. The leaves have already begun turning brown after all, so it is only a matter of time before the first snow falls. As the next meditation session then begins, we should also start asking ourselves who our next proper sidecaster is going to be. Maniac has the first level already unlocked, but Chutney and Freya are suitable, perhaps even better candidates as well. If you have any preferences, please let me know in the comments below. With four people meditating every day, we should be able to rank up the next person quite quickly, I think. And just to give you a quick impression of the speed of the construction process, in the evening we are still not even halfway there as the Raya relieves Redini, and it does indeed take another full day of hunting, pruning and meditation, and as you can see, we are still not there yet. Finally then, as the first rays of sunshine strike the cold bog, Thoraya finishes the construction on the following morning, all of that for an object with a beauty rating of 1. Yes, there was absolutely no reason whatsoever to use a marble for this, other than for narrative storyline purposes, and perhaps also to train up Redini's and Thoraya's construction skills a bit. In any case, the Cult of Jinx now finally has a place for the Horn of Edmo, and so, with the entire colony, including our first claw dried Krakenoid, assembling inside of our tree temple, Spex can now perform the honorable task of putting the horn on display. Doing so now also gives the reliquary the special effect of increasing the mood bonus for all rituals in this room by plus two. Not much, but we'll gladly take it. In fact, we'll take it right now, as this strikes me as a good time to have Spex give a passionate leader speech, and if things go well, we might even earn another ideology development point. And there we are, accompanied by the scarring of Jinx, our very own ritual music by Eric Murray, Spex delivers an inspirational speech, resulting in not one but two more ideology development points. And I would say, with the Horn of Edmo finally secured and with the Cult of Jinx in a great mood because of it, we have reached a great point to make the cut for today. And so, as we transition over to some fan art of Liviana's River Graveyard, made by Nolan English, we have a few interesting things coming up soon. In the next video, we'll probably try to push for those last two development points. We also still have a marriage to celebrate, and we need to train up our next sidecaster. Not to mention that Randy probably has one or two nasty surprises waiting for us as well. So stay tuned for that, and in the meantime, if you enjoyed today's episode, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.